So hello everyone and welcome to Medical Her Stories third annual feminist health conference. We're so excited to have you here. My name is Kainaz and I'm the director of operations here at Medical Her Story. I actually joined the organization after the first feminist health conference. Um, so it's always very exciting when this event comes back around. It's a little anniversary. And I know that for a lot of our volunteers, um, this event definitely holds like a special place in the work schedule for sure, but also I think in their hearts. Um, okay, amazing. So uh, I'd like to kick things off with a land acknowledgement. So Medical Her Story is based in Jojage or Montreal. Many of our events and operations are located on land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Kanikanaka of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Ruan Wendat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabeg nations. Medical Her Story recognizes and respects these groups as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which many of us are today. And we cannot begin to discuss patient advocacy, barriers to accessing care, or internalized stigma without recognizing the role that colonization, white supremacy, and medical racism play in the social structures which healthcare as an institution is situated in. So with that, we'll move along to some more kind of logistic uh, issues that we want to clarify before we get things started. So Zoom rules for today and tomorrow um, are, if you're comfortable, please do keep your camera on. We love seeing your lovely faces. Um, and it's so nice to be able to engage on that level with the community. Uh, please do remain muted if not speaking, but definitely feel free to use the chat. Um, and we do have active listeners present, so feel free to take advantage of that. There, um, It'll say active listener in their name on Zoom. Um, and please do be respectful to everyone. We're here to you know, share our perspectives, but at the same time, we wanna make sure that everyone is being respective um, and feels comfortable. Uh, please also note that closed captions are enabled for, the, uh, for all of the events, and you can activate them at any time during the event, as long as you're in the main room. Um, and before, okay, so, We'll go through the schedule for today. Um, so today is the first of two days of our conference. Uh, so to begin with, we'll have um, the keynote speaker, which will be going ahead shortly. Um, then at 12 p.m., we'll have our How to Handle Medical Mistakes or Medical Harm event, followed by a break at 1 p.m. And then at 1.30 p.m., we'll have our medical education workshop, followed by a networking event at 2.30 p.m. Um, please also be sure to check out day two tomorrow. Um, and please note that all of these times are in EST, so make sure to be doing those conversions if you need to. Um, and before we proceed, I do just want to note that we also have a workbook at this year's conference, which is created to be a sort of helpful resource to get you through the weekend. So it has information in it. It has fun activities in it. You can take notes in it. Um, it's very interactive and we're very excited to be sharing it with you today. Um, I believe someone is going to drop the PDF in the chat. Um, and I will let you know when that's done so you can download it. Um, there's also, I've been told, a very fun crossword in it. So for those of you crossword aficionados, um, there is something in there for you. Um, but yes, so with that, I think that's all the logistics sorted. And now I'm very pleased and honored um, to welcome our keynote speaker, Tori Ford, um, who is our founder and CEO here at Medical Her Story, the person behind the scenes, the person who keeps it all running, um, and a lovely friend. So Tori, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just get my slides up. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Kainaz. Always a pleasure to be co-hosting with you. Um, and welcome, everyone, to the Feminist Health Research Conference. As you know, this year we are focusing on the future of feminist health, and I'm so excited to be exploring all the possibilities of that today and tomorrow and what that could look like for us. So I like to always start some of my talks with a question. And today we're going to be talking about how can storytelling be used as innovation to advance the future of gender health equity? So I'd love if you know if you want to start thinking about that, jot down some notes, and maybe by the end of the talk, um, we'll have learned something together. And hopefully by the end of the weekend, um, we'll have some steps in moving forward. 
So a little bit about me and my positionality. Um, I come from a background in gender studies and I've always been really interested um, in research and how it can be used to advance activism. I went on to complete, uh, to complete an MPhil in health medicine and society at the University of Cambridge, where I got really interested in medical sociology um, and also started you know, exploring different areas within feminist health. I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing organizations like UN Women, Public Health Review uh, at Harvard, and CBC Canada. Uh, and of course, today I'm going to be speaking in my positionality as the founder and executive director of Medical Her Story. Uh, Medical Her Story is not only my pride and joy, um, but it's also an amazing organization. Um, and there's so many of our amazing team members in the audience here today and helping out. So Medical Her Story is an award-winning international not-for-profit, and we're on a mission to eliminate sexism, shame, and stigma from health experiences. And we advance gender health equity um, through many different ways, but essentially we are completely youth-led um, by and for people with lived experience who have experienced gender health inequity. Uh, here is our amazing mission statement. I always joke with our team, let me get this tattooed on me one day, um, but here it is for you to digest that a little more. And our approach to tackling this issue of gender bias in medicine is unique. We take this three-pronged approach, um, which targets healthcare professionals, both current and future, through medical education. We do patient advocacy, where we encourage people to learn about how to ask for the healthcare you deserve, because, as you know, we're never really taught how to seek out care or ask for it or navigate those spaces. Um, and lastly, we have undoing stigma, which is what we are all doing here today uh, by talking about difficult and taboo topics. Um, and normalizing those conversations. So Medical Her Story does amazing work and essentially it began as a storytelling uh, platform. It started with my own story, which we'll get into in a bit, but today we have shared over 40 stories on taboo topics relating to sexual health, mental health, um, physical health, chronic illness, and the likes. And I highly encourage you to check out all of the stories. And if you're interested in learning more about um, what it's like to share your own story, definitely reach out to us. We're always really uh, excited to get those on the website. We also decided that storytelling was such a powerful tool within our own um, establishment that we began using these stories as workshops uh, in medical schools all across the world and at some of the top organizations, as well as in universities for patients to learn how to self-advocate and um, within other healthcare networks, learning how to reclaim your story um, and tell some of these narratives in a way that was empowering and impactful. So today I'm really excited that our workshops team will be giving you a taste of one of our workshops uh, so you can learn more about that. We also hold events like this, our annual Feminist Health Conference. Uh, it is so humbling to see where we started uh, and where we are today. And in addition to that, we also hold storytelling sessions on sexual health, Indigenous health, trans health, and the likes. And uh, like you saw today, this is being recorded and will also be available on our YouTube channel, uh, along with all of the other events we've hosted. Finally, uh, social media is one of our biggest platforms. And if you're not following us, I really encourage you to. At the end of the weekend, there is a giveaway um, if you're following us that you can join and win some awesome prizes. But media has been one of the best ways to connect with all of our followers. And I'm sure many of you found out about us through these networks where we share educational tips for, about patient advocacy, health literacy, and the likes. And every now and then, and again, there's a really funny meme. So definitely check it out. But now I'm going to transition from talking about, uh, you know, what we do and what we sort of do in the everyday to really the philosophy behind it. So just going to open the floor up by asking you to put in the chat or unmute yourself. What comes to mind when you think about storytelling? I see Helen has, says sharing a human experience. Awesome. We've got Angelina connecting with others. We've got someone telling a story which conveys an important message, sharing your experience. A personal firsthand account instead of impersonal data. Awesome. An opportunity to connect with other humans, parting your wisdom. These are really powerful um, sentiments around storytelling. And when we think about these, 
words, you know, around connection, around, uh, you know, being personal, around connecting with others, it almost stands in contrast with what we're often taught about medicine, which is framed as this objective um, sort of, you know, system that's untouched by larger systems of sexism, sexism, racism, or ableism. But what if I told you that storytelling is at the heart of all health experiences, and it's how we listen and tell stories that matters. This is the philosophy that essentially started Medical Her Story and that I carry with me in everything that we do. So what do I mean by this? Just think about the clinical encounter. Uh, you know, essentially it's meant to be helpful for the practitioner and healing for the patient when you go and you seek out care and try to put into words what's wrong with you. But ultimately, this often fails due to the trust gap and the research gap. If you're unfamiliar with these terms, essentially what they refer to is the trust gap speaks to the fact that women and gender diverse people currently and historically are more likely to be dismissed as overly emotional or dramatic or untrustworthy within medical settings. Further, you have the research gap here, which speaks to the fact that conditions that differently or disproportionately affect women and people assigned female at birth are underfunded and under-researched, meaning that when clinicians attempt to help patients, they're often really limited due to this lack of answers. And as a result, there's this double bind, which leads to these damage and delays in healthcare. So um, what is it that we do about that? Uh, with Medical Her Story and in my own research, we use stories to transform damaging gender norms that propel shame, to empower patients to advocate for themselves within healthcare, to educate future medical practitioners on combating gender bias, amongst many other areas of how storytelling can be used to uh, advance gender health equity. And also the solution is essentially what our name means. So if you've ever heard Medical Her Story and wondered what a bizarre name, where did that come from? It essentially is challenging this notion of the medical history, that impersonal, sterile, limiting and brief encounter with a healthcare professional where you explain what's going wrong with you and they try to make sense of it. We recognize that there were many barriers that were gendered and racialized um, in these encounters, and we want to provide a new space that would be bold, that would be empowering, honest, lived, and ongoing. And that's what we've done not only with our publication model, but also the way we deliver workshops and hold events, um, which we're really excited about today. So Medical Her Story was founded upon lived experience. And of course, it began with my own story of medical dismissal, of living with years of chronic yeast infections, which is not a very sexy topic, but something that I sought out care for over and over and over again, only to be told things like wear white underwear, to just relax, or maybe take some time off school. It was at the point where I was being told things like some people get colds, some people get chronic yeast infections, that I started to internalize a lot of these messages and started feeling like maybe there was something wrong with me. Maybe it was right that, you know, I was just being a dramatic young girl and that everyone went through things like this and that it was normal and I should stop complaining. Um, but when I started sharing my story and I started opening up to people around me, people kept saying over and over again, it sounds like fiction, you should write it. And I thought that is insane. I do not want to be the poster child of chronic yeast infections. Um, but I did write it and I found it to be such a healing process. And that's when I stumbled upon something I found was really powerful of being able to take back your narrative outside of the medical encounter and use it in a way that your voice would be respected and listened to. Um, I went on to publish in our school newspaper at McGill, which was extremely bold at the time. Um, and instead of, you know, getting any pushback, what I heard was so many other students saying, you know, me too, I have such similar conditions of being dismissed or not listened to. And that's when I realized that this wasn't a me problem. This was much bigger than that and started looking into gender health inequity um, from both an activist side, but also within my own research. And like I was talking about before, recognizing the research gap that there was so little being done, I decided to do some of that work myself, uh, which I'll delve into now briefly um, to show you the connection between how you can take your lived experience and use it to advance research um, or activism or whatever field you're interested in. Um, and this project was was inspired by my master's research, which is quite sentimental now because that's what I presented at the very first feminist health conference two and a half years ago now. Um, so this is, you know, we've come pretty far, but um, for those of you who don't know, 1.2 million women in the UK suffer from recurrent thrush called chronic yeast infections in Canada. 
Um, and as you can see here from one patient representative, it's time to talk about it. And that is why I've been conducting doctoral research at the University of Oxford within primary healthcare, looking at the experiences and challenges with recurrent vulvovaginal thrush. And what we've learned is that there are negative long-term effects with recurrent thrush, such as negative mental health impacts, um, as well as sexual health problems. We know that this is a condition rooted in shame and stigma, meaning that when patients seek out care, they often face delays or they may avoid medical encounters altogether. When they do get the bravery to seek out care, too often they are dismissed. We know from groundbreaking reports here in the UK, like First Do No Harm and the first ever UK women's health strategy, that women often feel or worse are told that their debilitating pain is all in their heads or is something normal about being a woman or assigned female at birth. Further, we know that healthcare professionals um, are not taught about reproductive rights, um, and they struggle to learn about a range of different topics that they're interested in due to limitations in curriculum as well as in training. And lastly, there is simply a lack of research and online resources, and this is something that, of course, Medical Her Story has been trying to challenge. So my work is looking at how can we improve understandings of how recurrent thrush is experienced in the UK and provide resources to support self-management and medical treatment. Um, and this is sort of this long three and a half year process of determining what is known about recurrent thrush, gathering the perspectives and stories of patients and those of healthcare professionals to go on and develop an online resource um, that will support the management of this condition. So um, like I said before, it's really about gathering those stories and those lived experiences to um, underpin improvements. And what that looks like for any of those research nerds out there um, has been a systematic review of gathering information about what already has been conducted in this field and what can be improved. Interviews with patients, these are the most fulfilling part of my work that I do. It's spending an hour with someone and saying, tell me your story. It's essentially taking the medical her story model and using it in the research space. Um, I let patients talk freely about anything that they want and then I follow up about it um, in more depth, which has been amazing to hear from patients that often it's their first time they feel listened to or validated. And although these are difficult conversations to hear, um, I know that they're supported by my own positionality of being someone living with the same condition. And it's been um, really fantastic and healing to connect in those ways. Um, upcoming are some focus groups with healthcare professionals where we're going to delve into sort of bridging these gaps. Um, it's been really interesting transitioning from a gender studies background into the medical department. I now get to work with a lot of GPs on a regular basis, which I'm not used to. Um, and what I've realized is there is so, so much to learn here behind the scenes um, about the messaging that is taught in medical schools in terms of the training that's provided and also in terms of those uh, larger structures of sexism, racism, and ableism that unconsciously uh, can infiltrate on the medical practice. And of course, if you've seen Medical Her Story, you know we love a good online module. Um, so we're working in collaboration with Health Talk to put together a video series about chronic yeast infections that of course will be disseminated through Medical Her Story. And Medical Her Story has played such a key role in supporting this study. Um, we did recruitment through our social media platforms and had an overwhelming uh, sample of participants within a week. So uh, I know tomorrow some of the uh, presenters for our student research panel have also come and used Medical Her Story's resources. So we're excited to teach you more about that. And of course, something that was uh, very important to me throughout my work was making sure that patients were involved at every step of the way. Um, while I have the insider positionality of living with chronic yeast infections, I also recognize that I only hold one uh, very specific uh, condition as, you know, a white young woman, um, also who grew up in Canada. So it was really important to have people with a diverse range of experiences guide the project from the proposal stage to implementation. So we have a fantastic group together who bring their expertise in the form of lived experience. They hold me accountable by making sure I'm asking important questions. They support decision making. And then we work together with authorship and dissemination to make sure that the results are not only applicable to the people most affected, um, but also something that's tangible and useful in, in everyday life. And ultimately, uh, the goals here are to provide that high quality research and online resources that are missing and address that research gap. 
to empower patients to use their voices so that they feel more empowered to seek out care um, and ask for it, to have better informed healthcare providers so that when they are faced with these patients, they know how to react appropriately and have the resources, tools, support, and time necessary for that care. Uh, ultimately, this will go on to eliminate the sexism, shame, and stigma that Medical Her Story works to do every day. Um, and that'll go on to reduce the negative health impacts that I talked about earlier uh, and improve the lives of not only those 1.2 million women in the UK affected by this condition, but also everyone that's affected by social stigma. Because whenever you talk about these conditions, um, we advance change. So. I will leave you today with the voice of just one of these amazing women, um, Alex, who helped with this study, who says it's a silent and shameful issue with little options available. We must make it commonplace for those who are suffering to find space to talk about what they're going through without shame. That would have brought me some kind of relief. So I hope you enjoy learning a bit more about Medical Her Story and also this new research arm of what we're doing. And I hope it inspired you to think about your own feminist health research methods and how you can use storytelling as the tool to advance gender health equity. Uh, so these are my contacts, both uh, within Medical Her Story and professionally. So do reach out. I'm always really, really happy to talk and support. And if we can help your study in any way with uh, recruitment or dissemination, definitely don't be shy. Uh, but now I'll hand it over to Kainaz um, if there's any questions. Thank you, Tori, for a lovely presentation and speech as always. Um, no matter how many times I hear you talk about your research, every time I find myself, you know, still interested, still engaged, and it's always fascinating. Um, and I'm sure many of us here agree. So as Tori said, with that, we do have a few minutes for any questions that anyone might have before we move on um, to the next bit of our schedule. So if you do have a question, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll happily call on you. Um, but also if you feel that you prefer to ask something in the chat, um, you're welcome to do that as well, and I'll read it out loud. If you'd like to ask a question anonymously, you can just direct message it to me in the chat, um, and then I'll read it out loud without uh, mentioning who you are. So please feel free to raise your hands with any questions. Okay, well, maybe people are still getting warmed up. Um, so I have a question, Tori. Um, I was wondering, for those of us in the room today who aren't already a part of Medical Her Story, whether you had any you know, words of advice for how people can kind of enter the patient advocacy space or the nonprofit space, um, especially if you know it's something that they're new to or just learning about. Totally. Yeah, I think it goes back to the fact that you're the expert of your own lived experience and everybody has something to contribute. Um, definitely when I you know, told my story for the first time, I by no means was an expert in this space and I honestly had no intentions of entering into the not-for-profit space, let alone founding uh, this foundation. So I think, um, you know, reflect on what's important to you, what speaks to you. And if you're interested, definitely reach out. I found that within the not-for-profit space, people are so willing to share their experiences of how they got started um, or explore different options for entering the team. And as you'll see today, um, of course, this is an event um, which we put together and we have workshops later, but uh, there are so many different strengths within our own teams in terms of research, in terms of graphic design, um, in terms of being active listeners. So I think there's really something for everybody. And of course, I'm biased for Medical Her Story that if you're interested, definitely apply here. But there are so many other amazing partners we've worked with and um, people in this space that would be happy to support you. Absolutely. Um, and so we have a question in the chat from Helena. Hi, have you ever had your own experiences with the condition act as a barrier to realizing your research and interest goals? And if so, how have you dealt with or managed that? And yeah. Helena, you worded that perfectly. <laughs> Definitely. So I think there's sort of two schools of thought here. One's the more traditional uh, scientific sense of, you know, 
researches should not be biased and it should be purely objective and you should be a fly on the wall. Um, and that's how a lot of, I think, traditionally scientists have positioned themselves. Um, and then you have the feminist viewpoint, which says, that's total bullshit. Everyone has a positionality. Everyone has lived experience. Everyone has bias. The thing we do in feminist health is we acknowledge our positionality and where we're coming from. Uh, so I think I've definitely, I've, as I've moved from the more social sciences to the more scientific, seen a bit of that pushback, but I'm always very happy to sort of enter those debates and say that, you know, um, your story matters and it, it shapes your research. And even if you think that you are um, objective purely, that really never is the case. And unless you acknowledge your positionality, um, that's actually what can cause harm, not having a stake in, in the game. Absolutely. Um, and that was a great question and something that's so important to be discussing, because even coming from a science background, you know, it comes down to, well, who's deciding which questions are even being asked? Um, okay, speaking of, we have another question in the chat. Um, this is from Ellen, and she wants to know, in your research so far, what has been the most surprising finding? Ooh, surprising. Um, I think so far it's been how willing people are to talk about this. I remember when I was proposing the project, people saying, you know, ooh, are you going to get people really wanting to talk about their vaginas, wanting to have that recorded on video, wanting to have their stories broadcasted, whether anonymously or not? Um, and I think that, you know, I started to maybe worry about that too, but I've seen so many people that are so ready to talk about it. I think with these issues, we've reached a point um, of knowing when enough is enough. And I've been so fortunate to be able to support people in that process. So that has been really surprising. Um, I'm not too far into data analysis, but Ellen, I'll definitely let you know what comes out of it. Um, and there'll be papers and presentations and social media campaigns when that's all ready too. Absolutely. Okay, lovely. Um, and for everyone here, Ellen is going to be featuring on our student research panel tomorrow. So maybe someone can ask her about her most surprising finding. Um, but thank you so much. With that, it is 12 p.m. So we're going to hand things off to our uh, next event and event leaders. So I will let them take the floor. Thank you all so much. And I'm going to drop the workbook link in the chat one more time. So if you didn't catch it before, um, you can have a look now. Okay, thank you so much again, Tori, for that great speech. Um, moving on to our next event of the day. This one's called How to Overcome Medical Harm. Um, so we have some patients and physician perspectives to um, listen to, so it should be great. So let's briefly go over. Um, again, if you weren't here for the start, um, Medical Horror Story is the organization running this conference. We hold events, workshops, and publish stories to eliminate sexism, shame, and stigma from health experiences, um, events such as this one. Um, so this event focuses on medical harm, and medical harm occurs commonly and can have significant impacts on both patients and healthcare providers. These harms can happen when a patient is misunderstood, misdiagnosed, or mistreated in healthcare settings. Implicit bias, social structures of oppression, and gendered assumptions often underpin these actions. However, mistakes and missteps are often stigmatized and not discussed. So that's the reason we're having this event today to make sure that we're able to talk about it and eliminate the stigma. Um, so as a part of the Feminist Health Research uh, Conference, Medical History will be hosting a panel about how to overcome medical harm. As I mentioned, we're going to hear from healthcare professionals, researchers, and patient representatives about how to respond to and prevent harm. This panel will start the conversation around looking towards a feminist health future and be followed by our Overcoming Gender Bias in Medicine workshop. So as we have mentioned earlier, um, remain muted if you're not speaking. We'd love if you keep your camera on to see all your lovely faces, but only if you're comfortable feel free to use the chat. Um, and we also have active listeners present um, if you need to ask them any questions or anything like that um, and be respectful to everyone. Um, and you can see some of our active listeners are sending messages in the chat now so you know who to message if needed. We'll also have an open Q&A at the end of this um, event, but it'll be open from the start. So you can type your question in 
now if you go to menti.com or scan this QR code here um, to open it. We'll advertise this again at the end of the panel if um, questions come up throughout. And we can also throw the link in the chat for you guys to click as well. Um, but just if you have any questions for any of the speakers, and then we'll be able to ask those in an open Q&A session at the end. And just so everyone is aware before we get started, topics of discussion today may include sexism, racism, ableism, medical trauma, mental health, and other sensitive subjects. So this could be challenging for you, and we're very grateful to our speakers for sharing their knowledge and experiences. So please practice self-care and take breaks if you need um, at any point throughout this um, event. So without further ado, I am very pleased to announce our speakers for this event. First, we have our patient advocates. I'll introduce them one at a time, read their bio, and then we'll allow them to speak for about five minutes about their story and then move on to the next speaker. And then we'll have a bit of a panel afterwards, just so you know how the event is going to go. So first of all, we have Jenny Williams, who is the founder and CEO of Enhance the UK, a user-led charity campaigning to change public perceptions of disability. Enhance the UK provides face-to-face -face and virtual training to businesses and organizations on a variety of different topics surrounding disability awareness. All of their training is delivered by disabled trainers, utilizing a powerful combination of expert knowledge and lived experience. Jenny is very passionate about the charity's Undressing Disability Campaign, which focuses on the sexual rights of disabled people. So I'll hand it over to Jenny now to tell us her story. Hello. Um, I feel like saying London calling, um, but um, hello, thank you for having me on and um, to, to chat. So I, I kind of feel like I've got two hats on really. Um, so just to kind of give you a bit of a background of, of Enhance and, and why it was set up. Um, so I'm a hearing aid user and um, for many years I was working within social care and I was found I was finding that there was lots of barriers and things weren't being made accessible to me and one of the things that I was really noticing of the lot of uh, disabled people that I was supporting was there was nothing around sexual needs of disabled people and if there were was any kind of conversation around that it was very much based because there was a problem or the conversations were mainly around men's sexual needs rather than women's sexual needs or those who certainly identify as women so and this was like 15 years ago so it was a re really you know it was a difficult there was lots of um doors literally closed in my face and I was told it was inappropriate not to speak about it so I decided to speak about it and um, a bit like Tori who had a lot of passion you know and I thought right well, I want to set something up myself and um, so set Enhance the UK up now back in the day I couldn't possibly imagine we used in Enhance the UK couldn't possibly imagine that we would be talking to people around the world which we now do around the sexual needs of disabled people so we're looking at, um, you know, making sex education inclusive um, for sex edu uh, for for young people who to try and if nothing else, yes, you want to really empower people to have a, a active sex life. If that's what they want, but also to stop any kind of sexual abuse happening, naming our bodily parts by the right names. Um, but that also comes with if we have any medical issues as well, we want to be able to speak about that. If somebody's got a communication impairment, for example, is profoundly deaf. Um, all the way up to if we've acquired an injury or if something's happened to us. But one of the things around the campaign is looking at um, the right for women to get healthcare and um, people going for smears, for example. It should just be a given that we're able to do that. But actually, if you've got um, a disability, not always a physical disability, not always necessarily wheelchair user, um, but um, that actually getting in and accessing having a smear um, is incredibly difficult. If you're in care, a lot of the time it's just um, given a, a assumption that you don't actually need that whatsoever. So um, a campaign around um, looking at the sexual, uh, look at the needs for the, the and the rights for women to have inclusive healthcare and sexual healthcare has been a big part of our campaign. Now, 
while all that was happening and I was starting the campaign from a personal point of view, um, I was I had, I had children slightly slightly later in life um, and um, I was 40 when I was having my second child. And just after that, I was starting to get chronic pain in my in my vulva. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd never really looked at my vulva particularly before. I'd never really looked at it. And I was suddenly looking at it and I could see sores all over me. And I was going to the doctors and I saw three male doctors. And, you know, I'm really grateful for our NHS, really, really grateful. But every really, every time I was seeing a male doctor, they were saying, I think it's possibly an STI. I knew it wasn't an STI, yet I was constantly was being told that that's what it was. Um, eventually I saw a female doctor and she said I think you might have something called lichen sclerosis but I'm not sure and um, I had to then pay to go privately because we were in the, pand- in the middle of a pandemic as well um, and um, I saw a gynecologist and he said I think you might have something that's called chronic thrush but I can't really see my way through it to see if you've also got lichen sclerosis. Um, So then to to, to cut a very long story short and quite a traumatic story short, turns out I do have chronic thrush. I also have lichen sclerosis and I also have vulvodynia. Um, And all three of those conditions cause me chronic pain most of the time. And the irony was that I'd almost like my, my, my friends and colleagues joke that I set this charity up for my future self 15 years ago. Um, because actually, a bit like Tori said, one, you know, it really, while I was doing this anyway, I thought this is my chance to have a platform. This is my chance to really speak about this. And then quite a sinister um, uh, mark came up on my vulva. And I needed to go to the to the gynecologist. They needed to look at it. Now, when we were, you know, most of you imagine if you go into hospitals now, you still have to wear masks. And um, this was kind of we're still we were still kind of coming out of the pandemic. Now, normally I say to people, I'm a hearing aid user. I need to lip read. Could you take your mask down, please? So I can lip read. That's a reasonable adjustment for me. And I asked the um, gynecologist to do that and she refused to do it. Next thing, I was having a biopsy done on my vulva and I didn't know it was happening. Um, And I also have a, 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 I like to have many things, but I've also got a heart condition called long QT, which is otherwise, it's very sexy, otherwise known as sudden death syndrome. So any kind of adrenaline um, that can kind of do me in. So I I was not not in a good way. And I was very, very tearful. And it was a horrible, horrible experience. And eventually I was seen by the sexual health health clinic in Brighton who were amazing and I felt like I'd have held, I'd held all this in because for so long we are almost taught to be quite strong women not really complain about pain get on with it and no one was really taking me seriously to the point when I phoned the locum GP and I said I've got lichen sclerosis he didn't know what it was and therefore kicks in everything we're speaking about and me starting to research if this was a, a, a problem for, with, for men would we would I be living like would I be have lived like this for the last two and a half years with nobody helping me if men's penises literally had sores all over them and shrinking my the the um, architecture of my vagina's closed my clitoris is fused and um you know and I, I'm very itchy and sore this is what comes with the with the condition would we be would we be talking about this a lot more very very likely as sure a lot of you know with these conditions all I was given was a steroid cream and told to go on my way and use it um twice twice a week um so somebody said if penises are shriveled up then we would be getting vaccinations absolutely um so again I it was it was kind of a blessing and a curse I was trying to look for a silver lining with these things I just thought flip an egg you know I'm a CEO of a disability charity this is what I do for a living I, I speak very and shout very loudly about these things, yet there's me who has a voice. I haven't got a communication impairment laying down, having a biopsy done on me, and I don't didn't know it was going on. So it's just really proved how far we have to go. And through that, I'm lucky I'm on the platform that I'm on, that I've managed to do talks like this and sit on the um, sexual health panel and get a lot, lot more involved and trying to give women more of a voice um but 
my God, have we got a long way to go when it comes to this. And Tori, the work that you're doing, I think is absolutely amazing because I still battle hugely, especially with my, and I find it quite interesting that I can talk a little bit more openly about vulvodynia. I can talk a bit more openly about my lichen sclerosis, but somehow chronic crush still seems to be like a dirty thing that we don't want to speak about so much. And um, becoming single recently, um, having to have these conversations with new partners as well, how painful sex is and what that actually means. And it's not just one condition. And quite often we're finding that more and more women don't just have one condition. They have, you know, a multitude of conditions. Um, so um, we're bringing out an inclusive sex toy range um, in January um, because I find even sometimes using um, stimulation and um, vibrators around my vulva, um, around my clitoris, clitoris, obviously not just sexual um, pleasure, but can also bring me a lot of relief um, in pain, you know, with when I have pain. But what about women who don't have dexterity to be able to hold that um, or, or, or in a care home and, and, and carers won't allow them to do that? So we're looking at how we're, we're bringing out this range. It's hopefully very inclusive to people that have big buttons that people can use with their chins or use with their side of their, you know, their heads if they need to, because um, it's a privilege to be able to have the dexterity and the ability to put your own steroid cream on or be able to put cream on if you need to. And frankly, it's a privilege to be able to move yourself up and down if you're in pain. And it scares the hell out of me that something will happen to me that I won't be able to do that any longer. Um, so, um, you know, this is, this is a big problem that needs to be spoken about. And, and the last thing I need to say on this is that even actually the lack of knowledge from, I'm finding with local GPs of one of my best friends, and I'm so upset that I was right, um, was saying her daughter was in a lot of pain. And, the, and I said, it sounds like she's got lichen sclerosis. And the GP said, no, she can't have lichen sclerosis. That doesn't happen in children, only older women. And it was me going, oh, God. And sadly, I'm right. And she has got lichen sclerosis. I don't want to be right about it, but it just shows the lack of knowledge and information because it's a woman's health issue blows my mind. Um, so I think having these conversations, storytelling is huge, but we you know we're like, we always say in our, you know, within our organization, don't come to me with a problem, come to me with a solution, you know, and, and the idea I think there's any one easy solution, but building our voices and having more people take us seriously and hearing us, you know, all kudos to people who, who have the confidence to be able to talk about their shriveled up clitoris <laughs> and be able to speak about it because it's not sexy, is it? No one wants to do it. But if we don't do it, then um, then we're going to, lots of more people will suffer silently. So that's me pretty much summed up. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing your story. Like people are saying in this chat, it's very powerful. And I think everyone benefits from hearing more stories like this. So thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. And I'll share out um, a few people said about following us on social. Are you OK to add in my the enhances handles and stuff in the chats? Yeah, I think we can do that. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Okay, Thanks, moving on to our next speaker, uh, Rachel E. Gross is an award-winning science journalist and author of Vagina Obscura, which tells the story of how anatomists mapped the female reproductive organs and how a new generation is wrestling them back. She was previously a 2018 to 2019 Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT and the Digital Science Editor for Smithsonian Magazine. Her work has appeared in the BBC Future, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, Slate, and elsewhere. So Rachel, over to you to share your story. I think you are muted, there you go. Cool, awesome, perfect start. Um, hi everyone, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Uh, I didn't consider myself a patient advocate, but um, seeing the other people on this panel and hearing stories like Jenny is so inspiring and just really makes it clear how much work needs to be done in this area. Um, so I'm a science journalist um, who wrote a book that involved many women and people with ovaries, vaginas, clitorises, um, who were 
going through these medical journeys to get a diagnosis, to figure out what was going on in their bodies, and to better understand this biology that nobody had bothered to understand. Um, and the reason I was so interested in this panel was because many of those stories just were of medical harm or medical neglect, and they all had these like really strong patterns and similarities. Um, and it's clear that while medical, while medicine really needs to change to recognize these problems, um, I, I'm really interested in ways that patients also can advocate for themselves and can prevent this kind of harm from happening. So um, specifically, I, I talked to so many different endometriosis patients, um, trans men, women of color, um, young women, uh, and I spoke to a lot of people with chronic BV, um, which is bacterial vaginosis and um, kind of like chronic thrush, it's just a bacterial infection, an infection that keeps coming back and can be really um, disruptive. Um, and one of the ways I came into this book, since everyone's sharing their story, I would like to offer the same. Um, I was a science editor at Smithsonian in 2018, and I had this really bad infection that was super itchy and uncomfortable. And it lasted like a month and doctors said it was maybe a yeast infection, maybe um, a UTI, but it didn't feel like that. And it turned out it was BV. And the only solution that was offered to me um, after I had tried these antibiotic creams was something called boric acid, which is essentially rat poison. Um, and that's literally how my doctor described it. Um, and so I was putting this up my vagina and it turns out it's it's poisonous to inject to um, ingest, and it actually says that on the container. Uh, it says like skull and crossbones, keep away from pets and children. Uh, and one night, on accident, I was really really tired. Woke up and had these like pills that you're supposed to put in your vagina, and I got confused and I swallowed it, um, and ended up in the ER, um, basically thinking I was gonna die. Uh, so. I didn't die. It was not that much boric acid. Um, you have to take a lot of it to to die, but it is poisonous. And that was this moment where I just realized, like, I didn't understand what's happening in my own body. My gynecologist also didn't understand how this worked. Um, she even told me this probably wouldn't work and that for many, many women, uh, it comes back again and again. And this was literally an infection that one in three women before menopause have. So it's so insanely common. Uh, it can lead to like bad birth outcomes. Uh, it can disrupt like many parts of your life. And yet nobody had found an actual cure. We were still using this like archaic solution from the 1800s. And for some reason it was okay to have in your vagina, but not your mouth. So there was just like so many parts of this that spoke to these themes that everyone's been talking about of like women's health problems and vagina problems are often dismissed, they aren't taken as seriously, money's not put into them. And it's kind of this hand waving where like, oh, like this happens, like it's okay to feel pain and discomfort there because you're a woman and that's part of the experience. Um, so I just came here in case it would help to share and not really my experience, but kind of these patterns that I've been seeing in all the other people that I've spoken to. And again, I am really interested in finding ways forward from the patient side, because I know incredible doctors like Rachel Rubin, who I've been talking to for a story on women who have harm to their clitoris and vulvas because of medical neglect or lack of knowledge. Um, I know they're transforming the medical side, but I would like to think more about like the medical doulas, having someone informed with questions to come with you and what questions can we ask doctors when we're put in this position? Because all the people I've spoken to are incredibly smart and empowered and well-researched and they have this sort of like intuition or embodied knowledge about what's going on in their bodies and yet it often takes them eight years to get diagnosed for a doctor to admit what's going on to say it's not just anxiety or psychosomatic um, and so there's got to be a way to bridge this kind of knowledge gap this authority gap where um, patients have this expertise and knowledge about themselves but doctors either aren't willing to hear it or it's not in the right language um, so Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was really amazing to hear your story. And I think you're so right. We need to think about all the ways that we can help prevent medical harm, whether it's physicians on the patient side and everything like that. So that's a really great point. 
Um, so we do also have some physicians on our panel today. Um, first off, we have Dr. Scout, who is the executive director of the National LGBT Cancer Network and the principal investigator of the CDC funded LGBTQ tobacco related cancer disparity network. In this capacity, he spends much of his time prevent, providing technical assistance for governmental tobacco and cancer focusing agencies, expanding their reach and engagement with LGBTQ populations. He leads a team of specialists who focus on building tools and sharing strategies across state departments of health. So I will turn it over to Scout now. Hi, and thanks. Um, very happy to be here. This is uh, already pretty powerful, just even as a starting point. And so let me give you a little bit of my story. Uh, first of all, I'm a trans guy. That's kind of relevant to this whole situation. And I am a specialist in trans health as well. So for example, I did my dissertation on social determinants of transgender health. And I would say that in the, com and then I also provide a lot of technical assistance, as we'd said. I'm actually not a medical doctor. I'm a researcher, PhD. So that one tiny correction, I'm not a practitioner. But since I do spend a lot of time training practitioners, particularly in how to do a better job with reaching uh, my populations, particularly trans folks, that's where everybody has the most questions these days, I'm pretty well steeped in not only what some of the barriers are in the um, provider community, but also because I live in this community, um, what a lot of the experiences are that, that people are challenged with. So just to kind of give you a little bit of information, our communities are a really used to not being able to find providers who are even willing to treat us. Um, I think if anything, there has been a little bit like there was a um, big uh, Southern Comfort was a movie that came out maybe about 10 years ago or something like that. And it documented a guy who had a trans guy who had ovarian cancer and he went to 19 different providers and all 19 of them said some version of you're a freak please get out, I'm not gonna treat you. He ended up dying out of care. And it is interesting because in the time since, I really do feel as if the words around it have gotten slightly different. And yet this bottom line substance is the same. The providers have kind of learned to change their words to be, oh, I don't know enough about how to treat you. So you probably really should go to a specialist. But for many of us who are not in some of the bigger urban areas, or if we have you know, unexpected emergent issues that are going on, it still fundamentally means that we can't get to providers that we are that are familiar with our issues and are willing to treat us in the same way. Like I happen to live in a really um, advanced state, the second one in the country to pass trans non-discrimination. And yet with my doctor, I had to do the classic thing of find the protocol stuff to give her so that she could learn more about how to treat me and find, you know, use me as her test subject on how to become someone who could do decent treatment for a trans person. So our access to care issues are really, really profound. Um, we had a pretty recent study that came out related to oncologists, which is kind of my specialty area with cancer, right? And basically about 60% said, oh, they weren't exactly sure about treating trans people until they taught them a little bit more about what that might involve. And then 80% were like, yeah, I, we don't really know enough about how to treat trans people. Which of course, when you have something potentially catastrophic like cancer emerge, just really puts us in this horrific situation where you know we're less likely in the first place to even have the social support to have the kind of uh, life chances and life opportunities that the rest of the population has to start with. And then we go into an environment where you're basically a frequent flyer in the medical system because you have to see so many providers in such quick succession. And you never know with any one of them whether you're going to get the kind of shade that could literally be life-threatening. One of my friends, um, a trans woman, had talked about how she was in a healthcare system that was very welcoming, but she needed home health aid because she was so weak from her chemo. And to her surprise, one time as, well, it's not to her surprise that this happened, but she was taking a shower once and the home health aid did not want to deal with her naked body. So as a result, here she is basically weakly crying out from the shower for this home health aid to help her get out of the shower. And she's being completely ignored to the point where what was surprising where she's like, oh my God, with, you know, facing cancer, I might literally potentially die in the shower right now. Like, you know, not what you would anticipate would be the thing. Um, eventually the home health aide did finally get her out of the shower, but it gives you a little bit of a sample of some of the kind of phenomena that we unfortunately experience 
all too commonly. Just as, you know, and also just to kind of give another little bit of framing, you know, you've got a few different types of people in the trans communities. You've got trans guys like me who were socialized as female when we were younger. So we have a really interesting um, maybe insight and or more empathy and or potentially more understanding of what it's like to walk the world as a female, because at least for part of our life, we were often perceived as such and had to deal with like, you know, the fears of walking alone in the wrong places and all those sorts of just layers of things that are built into, you know, any woman. And then you have a whole growing list of people who are identifying as gender non-conforming. That's a really quickly growing population. And the interesting thing about that population that makes it particularly at risk is that for a lot of those folks, for most of my life, I've presented as gender non-conforming. For a lot of those folks, people can't put them in an easy binary, which means that all that kind of layer of which is honestly uh, misogynistic behavior starts to come out against those folks. And like I even remember, we worked with uh, New York City Hospital once to put together a video about how to take care of queer patients. And they're like, hey, that video is great. It really opens up some eyes. But that one person who identifies as he but who's breastfeeding, can you take them out of the video? That's just a little bit too much. So you can see again, whenever we actually challenge the concept of the gender, gender binary. People react in very poor ways, even people who are well-meaning and attempting to learn more on the subject. And then of course, the third crew that we've got is trans women, people who are so very clear that they are women, that despite being socialized as guys, they give up so much of their social status and, and so much of their opportunity for safety and for jobs because it's so compelling to them to really be their authentic self. And I will say that out of all those groups, trans women get the most hostility by far, and then trans women of color even more. So um, like just as an example, more trans women of color are killed with hate crimes every year than any other group that's been tracked. And since trans women are a tiny group in the population, the fact that more of this tiny group is being killed than some of these much larger groups that are being tracked to is just a profound comment on the level of safety and lack of safety, life-threatening lack of safety that these women experience. And it, it is really in that kind of scenario where we've gotten some of our most um, horrific stories of what's happened with the medical arena. One of the ones that I, one of the women I talked with in my trans, in my dissertation work was very clear because she had gone, actually it was to that same hospital, honestly, many years earlier, and she had gotten gang raped in the hospital that she was really clear that she's like, if I ever have another car accident, anything like that, leave me on the street because do not take me back to the medical system. I would rather die on the street than go anywhere near another doctor again. So that's a little starting point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I can't even imagine how challenging it must be to not feel like you can trust the healthcare system at all. Um, but hopefully through panels like this, we can work to change that. So thank you again for sharing yours and your friends' stories. Um, our final panelist is Dr. Rachel Rubin, who is a board certified urologist with fellowship training in sexual medicine. She's an assistant clinical professor in urology at Georgetown University and owns her own practice in Washington, DC. Dr. Rubin provides comprehensive care to men and women. She treats issues such as pelvic pain, menopause, erectile dysfunction, and low libido. Dr. Rubin is currently the education chair for the International Society of the Study of Women's Sexual Health and an associate editor for the journal Sexual Medicine Reviews. She was named a Washington top doctor in 2019 to 2022. So I'll pass it over to you, Rachel, to share your perspectives on this topic. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Tori, give me, or Gemma, give me a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Um, what an absolute honor to be here and what a he what a heavy hitting panel to uh, finish up. Uh, and thank you all for sharing your stories. I think I can pull it all together, actually. Holy shit balls, we have a lot of work to do, right? Like, we have so much work to do. And this is hard work. Um, and so I want to share just a couple of ideas, um, just to give you an idea. Medicine, we love binary, right? Scout, uh, thank you for sharing your story. We love not just gender, we love uh, binary, we love everything to be black and white. We love, uh, we love easy, right? Abortion, good 
or bad, hormones, good or bad, um, you know, uh, transgender, good or bad. We, we love, uh, as Americans, we love COVID, good or bad. We love easy. We do not do nuance well as a society. We do not do gray well as a society. And there is so much gray here, right? This is a lot of gray. And in a way, um, so this is what I like to call biopsychosocial, all of these issues. And medicine, in the way it is currently practiced, whether at the NHS or in the United States healthcare system around the world, is a dumpster fire of brokenness, right? This idea that you can do anything in 10 minute visits and that a doctor can fully know you once a year in 10 minutes after you get your pap smear and your mammogram is insanity, right? The reason, you know, and all I've started to do is just ask questions is, you know, let's talk about feminism for a second. Why is the gynecologist responsible for everything that has to, like everything that a woman goes through, it's insanity. There's no doctor for men. I'm a urologist, so I'm a doctor for men. And I am not responsible for anything other than the penis, the bladder, the prostate, and the kidneys, right? That's all I'm responsible for. And yet a gynecologist who gets one year less training than a urologist, who gets less surgical experience than a urologist, is responsible for keeping a mother and a baby alive, is responsible for emergency surgeries in the middle of the night, to be an ICU doctor, to be a lactation consultant, supposed to know everything about sexual health, give me a break, people. Sexual medicine is always going to be at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to um, anything, right? Cancer is always going to be more important. Uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes is always going to be more important. And so uh, the reason I am good at this is because I know how much we don't know. And I advocate, I, I, I treat all genders. And so I come at this from urology where we love quality of life for our male patients, right? We love to talk about erections and orgasm and pleasure and urinary health. We don't do that for our women patients. And so my advocacy work is sort of around that of why don't we care more about quality of life for everyone because it's always important. And so here's, we have so much work to do, right? There are 27 fellowships in the United States for men's sexual health, 27. We have one that even acknowledges women's sexual health, just one. And it's the one that I did. And, and we, we take care of everybody, not just women. That has to change, but that has to take advocacy and funding and also the people to do the work, right? I was just talking with Rachel Gross. I said, we need more people to actually do the work, to know how to do this. Um, I am the education chair of ISWISH, I-S-S-W-S-H, which is an international organization where we train people to do the work. We have courses, but it's limited. We need to do more, right? There is, uh, this is why I feel like, you know, if anyone's seen Hamilton, there's a line in the, the musical of why do you write like you're running out of time? I am constantly running because I we need to train the next generation. We need to take care of patients like Jenny and Scout and, and, and we need to take care of them, but we also need to educate doctors, educate patients, um, uh, have everyone read Rachel Gross's book, have everyone buy Jenny's uh, devices that are going to be more inclusive because we're not good at this for able-bodied people. Now you add disabilities and nuance and gray and we're hosed, right? Like it's that's, but that means we have to work harder and get louder. So I just want to quickly um, uh, uh, say, you know, again, um, uh, we women uh, tend to be more, um, um, and this is very uh, a, a very broad thing to say, but we tend to go into psychosocial uh, fields of study because we are welcomed and we have a voice and and it is incredible what has been accomplished in the psychosocial world. The problem is when you get to medicine and biology and women are not fostered and mentored and brought up into the basic science research world. And so we are 20 years behind. And so we love in, you know, again, men's sexual health is about 20 years ahead because the basic science and the work and the money goes into men's sexual health. And we put our money, resources, and time and knowledge into the psychosocial parts of women's sexual health and ignore the biology. And there is so much biology, right? It's biopsychosocial. So I just want to quickly end, um, I, as you know, I could talk for hours and hours on this, but I want to quickly end with, with the first patient that I ever saw when I came out of my fellowship. And this was 2017. And the very first patient, I, I really believe that God had something to do with this. The very first patient that showed up on my doorstep was a, a trans a male who came in with a, a, a very a significant pelvic pain. And right when you're right out of fellowship and you, you get your first patient to come in, you're, you know, it's always very nerve wracking. I said, wait a minute, 
I take care of all genders. I know how to take care of all genders. I know how hormones affect the body. I know, uh, uh, Jenny, how hormones can lead, like lack of hormones can lead to lichen sclerosis and chronic thrush and pelvic pain. I know how having your ovaries removed can lead to a vulvar pain and genitourinary syndrome of menopause. I said, I can take care of this person because I understand how the biology works. So who shows up? What are your body parts? What are this, the hormone status? How are, you know, what is your psychosocial situation? And then let's put it all together to say, how can we make your quality of life better? And it didn't, it was not complicated to take care of a patient. In fact, it was quite easy. Uh, and, and, and the hard part is the education and, and getting the, the, everybody to understand. And that patient uh, has thrived and uh, he's a therapist actually. And he refers tons of patients to me, uh, but our colleagues. And that is what, you know, the magic of this is because I can't just treat the patient in front of me. I must get you all to be, and you are all here. So you are loud and advocates and screaming at the top of your lungs. And so we have to push and keep pushing. And so, gosh, holy crap. Thank you for like bringing me onto this panel. Thank you for doing all that you do and uh, learning about all these other um, uh, people doing the work because that's really what it's gonna take. And I believe that one person uh, very loudly can change the whole world. And I have so many friends and colleagues who are changing the world just from being loud on social media or just from like pushing. If you follow me on social media, I push and push and push very small, very simple topics, but it has led to very meaningful change, right? The American Urologic Association has agreed to do a guideline on genitourinary syndrome of menopause just because I tweet about it, right? Mark Cuban has lowered his of vaginal estrogen because I tweet about it and my friends tweet about it. Like the world is changing and we are making progress. It's so slow. And sometimes it's hard to get out of bed in the morning, but I just need you all to understand that your voices really, really matter. Uh, and so the louder you can get the better. And so just thank you. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. And I think it's so important to have advocates like you and hopefully we can all continue to be advocates and make sure that sexual health does come to the forefront. Um, so with that, that's all of our panelists today. We have a couple of questions for you before we move into um, the general Q&A from the audience, but a reminder that you can always put your questions in the mentee um, if you have questions for people. So the first uh, question we have for you today is, what role do you believe research disparities play in leading to medical harm? So maybe we'll start with Scout as the researcher uh, themselves. Well, so I think it's an interesting question because the challenge with health disparities, of course, would be that there's systematic groups of people who are experiencing worse health outcomes in the first place. We think of them as, first of all, they're queued up by a whole bunch of life factors, right? Like if you're not going to get good healthcare when you're a kid, if you don't have access to, you know, uh, good dental care, all sorts of things like that, if you have the added stress as a person of color in this world, et cetera, et cetera, those all create bigger medical problems. But I feel like a lot of, at least in the world that I live in, health disparities are really compounded by doctors being assholes. So, the, you know, you've got what we call access to care when we're, you know, putting our fancier hats on and everything like that and access to care barriers. But unfortunately, so much of our provider institutions are staffed by, you know, those cis, white, straight, heterosexual guys that haven't yet been trained or show a lot of propensity to understand how a lived experience in the world is different than theirs. So all the, you know, bigotry that we see in the world is really much more reflected in the medical world than I think we're willing to often acknowledge or accept, because if so, we'd be doing more training to counter it. We'd be, you know, doing more work to make sure that people did not bring that into the room with them. But, you know, at the same time, you know, at least for the trans community, every single legislative session there is in the United States, a new record of anti-trans bills that are being introduced. So we have a new wave of hostility against us at the legislative level. In the same way, those things are conveyed into the medical world too, and they give a level of permissiveness for people in the same way that we've seen, you know, recent pushbacks against, you know, uh, critical race theory training. It gives a level of permissiveness for people to express bigoted responses and feel as if they're not really going to get much of a problem for that. And the sad truth is too often they don't. And those things then create a real problem for the people who are trying to get optimal health in the middle of a system like this. That's 
so true. If any of our other panelists have anything to add on to that, feel free to hop in. Um, I just wanted to say that that is so true, Scout. I just like moments I had while reporting my book really shocked me. Like I spoke to researchers that literally spend their whole career studying menstrual blood. And I ended up being the one to explain to them the difference between a trans woman and a trans man. And they weren't taking that information in, in their research. And just like, it seems like a really, really basic LGBTQ care course, like in medical school would have addressed that. Um, it wouldn't address the asshole thing, obviously. Um, but it was also just so obvious how like if, if when I talked to endometriosis patients um it, the hurdles were so much greater when you were a trans man you like first had to get doctors to even think that this was possible and then they would say well we don't know how to treat it like you and Rachel Rubin have been saying and like we need a specialist and then they would then have these deep laden hostilities about like well we can't remove your uterus or ovaries like that might be part of your gender affirmation, like just because it would help you survive, um, like this is wrong. So yeah, there's there's so many levels to this, but I, I don't. Um, there's also a structural level too that I, I mean, I, I know one guy who's in pain every day of his life. Why? Because they affirmed him and marked him as male on his health insurance, which meant that anything having to do with assigned female at birth only body parts was not covered at all. So, you know, despite having amazing health insurance, he was getting zero coverage for anything that, you know, assigned male at birth didn't have, you know, on board factory installed. So yes, I agree. So many layers of this. I will say just again, for a hopeful point, and, and I will say trans care and research is exploding because there is more government funding and there's more coverage of surgeries and things like that. And people are doing some work, not just into, can we make new body parts, uh, but can they work and can they function and how do they drive? And that's something that I'm very passionate about is, is it's not enough to make a penis or make a vulva or make a vagina, but what is the quality of life implications? How do people, how do people want to use these things and are they able to? And I actually believe, and I, I talk about this a lot on social media, that transgender research is going to help all genders so much because, because right, you would never tell. So I, we say this in hormone therapy and menopause, if you take someone like Caitlyn Jenner, who is 73 or four years old now, right? When does Caitlyn go off her estrogen therapy? She's not going to. So why does a cisgendered woman at 73 have to go off her hormone therapy when we've been telling her for years, it's, we love to tell women, you cannot do this with your body. This is not safe to do. And so there is more of an understanding of this shared decision-making and this body autonomy, which we're having a lot of struggle with right now, of course, in 20, I'm in Texas right now, good to give a conference. So, you know, we have a lot of feelings, um, but right. So there are some good, it, it, it's a lot of bad, but there are little glimmers of hope. Can I, can I do, while well, we're kind of on this subject, um, Scout, you mentioned, uh, um, about the carer um, and not supporting that person that you know but I think that a lot of this and it's not directly answering the question that was answered I appreciate but while we're talking about this there's also there's such lack of education and I feel really bad for so many care staff because they get paid minimum wage they work bloody long hours they get thrown in and they don't they get very very little training and then they're expected to support people and some people just don't have that you know any exposure to anybody other than themselves and people like them and there's such you know we run training in care homes specifically looking at working with carers looking at sexuality looking at working with the lgbt plus community getting them to say words like vagina and vulva. I mean, that's part of the battle without calling it a foo foo or a fairy. So let alone then supporting somebody who's transgender, it just can blow people's minds. But I don't think it's yeah. We education is the key, and like basic education and getting people to talk about these things, because carers a lot of the time get a really hard time, and I don't always think it's it's their fault. So we need to be looking at that. And care staff and nurses who are doing a wonderful job, but just don't get enough support really. Thank you so much, everyone. Those are all really great insights. Um, and I, our next question, I think you've touched on a little bit and I think education is definitely 
a really important aspect, but do any of you have any additional thoughts on what you think can be done at an institutional level to reduce medical harm? And maybe we'll start with um, Rachel Gross this time. Oh. Um, or someone else if you need a moment to think about it. I mean, to me, like I, I think I'm gonna tee up Rachel Rubin because um, there clearly are practitioners who are really aware of exactly where the system is broken and who are even developing all these educational resources that are training people to be compassionate and understand the right terms and like realize that we're taking care of all the same body parts. Um, what seems so difficult in my reporting on the medical world is that it's such a conservative culture. It really is really difficult to change at the education level of like, how do you disrupt future doctors before they're done with medical school and then don't have the motivation or incentive to update their training and their understanding. Um, and it, it seems like that is just a long bureaucratic process. And it is important that this sort of training we're talking about and the training that someone mentioned in the chat that Canada is implementing like should be mandatory, not continuing education that self-selects the people that care about this. This needs to be like, if you care about patients, period, if you're a doctor, you need to care about this. Um, so I, I feel like that is or should be the next step. Yeah, so I agree. I mean, again, I think it's changing. God, it's slow. It's so slow. And, and I want it to speed up, but things are changing. We, um, and, and I think Jenny said it perfectly, right? Start with education uh, of what to call body parts, right? Uh, of, of, of just taking away the stigma. And so much of my magic is that I keep things super basic when I lecture, right? I talk to people. I actually don't lecture. My slides are no different when I'm talking to doctors than when I'm talking to medical students, when I'm talking to patients. It's all the same slide deck because nobody knows anything, right? I practice in Washington, D.C., where people are the most educated and super wealthy and really knowledgeable. They all went to Harvard and Yale. And the thing I love about my job, if I could literally distill what I love about my job is that I, they don't know anything, right? I get to explain to them basic anatomy. I get to hand them a mirror and show them their vulva, give them a tour of their vulva and say, this is your labia majora. This is your labia minora. This is your clitoris. This is your vulvar vestibule, which you've never heard of and causes so much pain with sex. This is your vagina. This is your pelvic floor. And it's incredibly mind blowing so much that Rachel Gross, you know, is writing an article just about that, that topic. Right. And so I think it's the basic things and it's changing. The medical students are not allowing for them to not know these things. Social media is incredible what it's doing to allow for patient advocacy and get patients to rise up and say, this is not acceptable. And so I think we have as, as we keep saying, we have so much more work to do, but I do think there is hope and taking away some of the shame and the stigma of private parts. My niece, who also has lichen sclerosis, Jenny, and thank God my sister was able to send me a picture of her vulva when I was in fellowship and say, what's going on here? And I said, holy crap, I was across the country. I said, holy crap, let me send you to the world's leading experts, who's my colleague, you know, and I got her in, you know, the next week and she got treatment. Now she is now uh, uh, you know, 12 or 13, she's probably somewhere on the neurodiverse uh, spectrum and probably has some gender issues as well. And yet my sister commented the other day and said, gee, like, like Ella's so comfortable talking about her period and talking about her vulva and talking about her lichen sclerosis. And they credit me for that because I'm all, we're always talking about it. It's, it's not weird. It's not strange. They're just words and body parts like your arm or your leg or your nose or your face, right? Why does a bloody nose feel fine? But a bloody vagina once a month is all of a sudden this like horrific thing. So it's, it's taking away that stigma. And so that doesn't have to be medical, right? That can be Jenny's group and Rachel Gross's book and your organization, like that stuff is so valuable, all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I think that's great advice for all of us to continue to be open about everything and just be a positive influence for others around us. Um, and hopefully that will eventually institute some positive change. Um, so in terms of the 
patient side, um, how do you think patients should advocate for themselves to avoid medical harm? And maybe we'll start with Jenny on this one. Um, I think it was um, Rachel. Can I just say, I'm very, I'm, I'm not very, you know, British people aren't gen generally very good at being gushing, but can I just say, I feel very gush, you know, I feel really enthused being on this panel here when you guys speak I can you can probably see my head is going to fall off because everything you're saying I'm like yes um so that's me being gushing I feel very, very privileged to be talking with you guys and um and from a patient's point of view um uh, I think it was Rachel that mentioned um doulas you know or having some kind of support you know that is um a huge that would be amazing um to be able to because a lot of the time even when you're going in you can't take this information in sometimes if it's about you and especially if it's about your private area that you're an older person you've never really heard the term vulva you know etc 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 and then suddenly you're hearing these terms that you're not really that used to hearing about you don't necessarily even understand them properly or you've got your husband I'm just thinking about my my mother and father um my dad's profoundly deaf they're always together as interpreters. There's very little interpreters on the NHS that is available. You've got to book one. And then having a member of your family then having to explain or sign or, you know, translate very, so something very, very private. So there's that there's that element of it as well, being able to have that support and then being able to have ongoing support. I, again, in this country particularly, you know, we are so... Um, overwhelmed the NHS is so overwhelmed you know and we are doing a fantastic job and like I said I'm now getting brilliant care and I'm really grateful for that for free and I'm so grateful um but it it did take an awfully long time to get to get there but those who especially are in this country knowing that there's pals knowing that there's somewhere that you can go to and speak to pals who will then talk and advocate on your behalf um to um to the medical and say there's a problem with this knowing what your rights are basically as a patient that's what you need to do and that's what I needed to do I needed to go away gather my thoughts and gather my emotions and say this treatment is not okay what do I do about it without being seen as being annoying because at the same time you don't want to put yourself back and not get the trait because you're in agony and you can't think straight and you're in an absolute mess and one of the things I didn't actually say is when what she said to me was are you sexually active now, that might not seem a big thing, but at the time, that was a huge thing for me because in theory, I was sexually active. The reality was I was very definitely not sexually active. And she turned around and said to me, if you, and I said, should I use dilators? And she said, well, you should just be having sex three times a week. What's the need for dilators? And walked out of the room. And that was one of the most devastating things for me because suddenly I just, my whole world fell apart then. So it's a bit, you know, it's about, that's actually one of the things I did end up making a complaint about using the right words and understanding when she should say those things to me wasn't OK. And especially wasn't OK when she was walking out the door. So the long winded answer is um, knowing the support networks around you, depending on where you live and what kind of, you know, I think it's different if you have private health care slightly. But certainly for here, having that support like powers is really useful. I would also maybe um, say, I, I think that a lot of what you're talking about related to the support is so key. And if we think about it, we're more willing to like, you know, be wing people for each other and talk with each other about like who we had sex with last night. Then we are willing to talk about whether we're going to get any preventative care, how our doctor's visits are going, whether we have a medical, uh, medical home, a doc doctor who's encouraging us to get, you know, all the right screenings and everything like that. So I think one of the real challenges in a lot of this is that honestly, a lot of us are trained to have poor care and to not have that expectation that we're gonna have good respect in the care world, right? So I just encourage like all of us, if we wanna try and make a little bit of a shift, think about your own social group, your own friend group and your own colleague group and figure out how we can start to have some more conversations around, so what's happening with your health too? You know, hey, I just went to the provider for my checkup. Boy, this, uh, da, 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 da. you know, whatever it is you can do to kind of start having the conversations, check in with people, particularly if there's anybody in your life who's even a more vulnerable population than yourself. We recently had one of um, our uh, most amazing black trans uh, media voices literally drop dead in a parking lot way too young. And it wasn't until after she did drop dead 
that we understood that she had not been seeing a doctor for many, many, many years. She'd been getting her hormones off the black market. She'd been getting her surgeries by going to another country. She was not in care at all. So I guess I encourage us to push back against this idea that our medical interaction should be a secret part of our life. Let's get it into the public domain more, talk about it so that we can help build these expectations of a better care environment than we're used to getting now. I love that so much. And I love the idea of medical advocacy. And I work a lot, I, I work a lot with different advocacy groups. There's a group called Tight Lift, which does vulvo vaginal uh, advocacy. Uh, there is a group, um, I, I believe persistent genital arousal disorder. The only reason we know anything about it is because of advocacy groups, these hidden Facebook groups that have uh, combined uh, and, and, and changed the world of that field uh, in the last handful of years. And so ISWISH, the, the organization I'm education chair of, we have a whole advocacy uh, part of the organization and it's really growing. Uh, and I believe that we have to all work together um, and we have to take away this Facebook, Instagram model of, oh, look how beautiful I am with this filter and look how everything in my life is fabulous. And we also have to invest in science and research. And we are so angry at the medical community. There's so much anger at all the gaslighting, which there should be, it's adequate. But the answer is not to then just go into the snake oil space of uh, a supplements and non uh, uh, non-medical grade things. We must invest in science. And so we're hurting, you know, women often go to that space because it's warm and cuddly and it listens more. And it also takes advantage of women, right? This idea that, oh, use this crystal and it's going to fix everything. Uh, where's your evidence-based double blind control trial with this crystal? I'm not a anti-crystal, I'm just pro-science. And so it, it, it feels very easy to kind of not go into that medical space, but then that allows allows the medical community to keep behaving the way that they're behaving and they cannot do that. They cannot do that, right? I had a colleague, I was at a retirement party last weekend and my co-resident, so he's now six years out of his resident training and he sees general urology patients, men and women, all kinds. And he came up to me and he whispered in my ear as a source of pride that he hasn't examined a woman in seven years, right? He added like, like as a source of pride because he knew it would boil my blood. And that was his way of saying, hey, how are you? And that's what we're dealing with. Like that is like, I just, it, it's really not sitting with me well, but like, so we have to like force the, met, like, we have to force change. Thank you so much everyone for everything you said there. Um, and I think you guys are all doing an amazing job of making change and hopefully everyone can take that to heart as well. And I know that we are at our time limit. I think we'll keep going with some questions because I'm really personally enjoying this discussion. Um, but if any of you need to take a break, feel free to do so before our workshop starts at 1.30. Um, we have one more question for the panel and then we're gonna go into the Q&A. So feel free to stick around if you want to, but um, also feel free to go to the Q&A. So our final, um, Question is, is a future without medical harm possible? And maybe I'll start with Dr. Rubin for this one. No, there is no future without medical harm. We will always harm people in medicine. We will always, uh, there are always pros and cons and uh, risks and benefits to anything that we do. And uh, as I tell all of my patients is we make the best decisions that we can with what we know in on September 17th, 2022. And the thing about medicine is that's going to change. We're going to learn. So every 10 years, it all changes and we learn new things. So when you go to see doctors, you have to see providers who give a shit, who really listen to you, who get to know you and who will work with you, right? In community to help you achieve your goals. I cannot, I'm not a magician. I cannot wave my magic wand and make your vulvar pain go away, but I can give you all the knowledge that I have, where we have it, and then bring in team members to say, well, this is where we're going to get the psychosocial, and this is where we're going to get the musculoskeletal, and this is where we're going to, you know, send you to, because they know a little bit more than me about X, Y, and Z, and so those are the types of providers that you need to see, the ones who are open-minded, who may say, hey, I don't have a transgender fellowship, but I care very much about you as a person, and I want to work with you uh, to say, okay, what do we know, what don't we know, and be quick to phone a friend 
friend or phone a colleague. Those are the providers. So I am not perfect. I get pronouns wrong sometimes. I, uh, I, I don't know everything, but it is my willingness. I actually think my willingness to say that I am wrong or I don't know or I'm sorry, that actually makes me a good doctor. It, it is my empathy. It is my ability to really care about the human as my patient. Uh, and I think get that. I have patients who get mad at me. I have patients who are annoyed with me or who think that they're I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I can't fix everybody. But it's I understand that it's a frustration, right? When you're at a place where science is at its edge, and unfortunately in women's health and in trans health, we're at the edge, right? There is so much more. There are so many more questions than we have answers. But that's how science has always been. And that's how science will always be. And so be patient, be advocating and, and know that we are, you know, many of us are doing our best, um, but we have to raise the bar for, for all the providers out there. And so, yeah, again, thank you for having me. And, um, and I would add like, yeah, they'll never be, for all the reasons Rachel said, they'll never be a perfect medical world where we don't have medical harm. Um, but I think we can and will have a more accountable world where these stories won't slip through the cracks and things will be done to redress um, what's happened and we can make less medical harm. And I just wanted to mention that I've seen more and more stories of unfortunately medical harm and, and dismissive doctors like coming up in social media and um, on Twitter and in these platforms. And I just want you to know that like journalists who cover this space are watching and want to amplify those voices and look for trends. So when I see that people are having like horrible uh, IUD insertion experiences, like that often becomes a story about why women's pain is dismissed and uh, what like what can be done about it. So I think the fact that patients are speaking up more, those that are comfortable um, in public spaces that allow journalists to document and often I think doctors to understand the effects of what's happening um, is making this all more transparent and helps people care about it and understand how big the problem is. So keep telling your stories, please. Can I just add on to that? Actually, as well as it being kind of accountable, like more informed and I think that everything that you um is saying Rachel about you know going and find somebody who gives a shit you know finding the right doctor actually that can be really hard you know and it can be so like how do you know how do you know where you're going how do you know if they're any good or if they care and that's why things like this are really important hearing people's stories because I was desperately going through all these forums or on Facebook groups and actually they can be a bloody depressing place you know sometimes the misery likes company and you're like sucked into like people's woes and pain and then sometimes you need that and other times you really don't need that um and that can be more depressing and harmful on your mental health so actually you know um stories about good practitioners that you've worked with and stories about good practice um that is so useful and my best friend's a gp and she'd be the first to say like there's so much that i don't know about this and we oh tell me sit jen and tell me about what you've been through and that really helps me that she she's like you she gives a shit you know she wants to learn about it so sharing these stories are just is what you said at the beginning Tori sharing stories are the most is, is the most powerful thing it really is okay amazing thank you so much everyone um we do have a couple of questions that came into the Q&A so I'll pass it over to Selma now to coordinate some questions from our audience I just say one little thing in response to that last question too Absolutely. before we jump in okay great i do want to say that yeah you know i completely agree with rachel we're not going to get rid of medical harm but i, I would say when we take some of the biggest longest views like my mother is a lesbian and you know she was raised not to tell anybody about the fact that she was a lesbian and so you know she's now 70 whatever years old and she doesn't talk about it with any of her providers and so she really has missed out on you know um helping educate her providers and helping the providers you know, be as supportive for her real self as possible. You know, in comparison, one generation down with me, I have a lot of friends and myself that have had a lot of medical harm from providers. 
but you know I'm seeing the forefront of like all these places are now rewriting their protocols to get you know uh, gender language out of the protocols to be more trans welcoming. So I love to see these kinds of changes. Go another generation down to my daughter, and she has yet another level level of lived experience as a queer woman, where she's like, hell yes, I'm definitely going to tell everybody I'm a queer woman as a starting point. So like, there's this. It's happening slowly, but generation by generation, we're each starting from a different point that's a little bit closer to where we ultimately want it to be. And that's exciting to see. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say thank you to all of our fantastic panelists today for sharing all your insights, perspectives and experiences. As you can see in the chat, everybody really, really appreciates you guys being here. We're learning so much. Um, as Gemma kind of mentioned, we're a little bit over time. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna just pick one of our questions. We've had a ton coming in throughout the event. Um, so with patient experiences, we know that if patients have had medical harm, undoubtedly their trust with the medical system is going to be broken, if not at the least shaken. Um, how do you guys think that physicians can work to ensure patients maintain trust or rebuild that trust with patients in terms of their trust with the healthcare system after medical harm has occurred? I can pop that question in the chat as well. Uh, I guess as the physician on the group, um, gosh, it's, it's, I think there's a big problem in the medical, I mean, med medicine, as I said, is a dumpster fire of brokenness. We should put that on t-shirts, but um, I think it, there's a big challenge in medicine because if you have a bad experience with a doctor, a lot of times, if you're again, privileged enough to be able to do this, you'll go to a different doctor. And um, that doctor then never learns, never hears the story, never gets to say, sorry, never gets to like, to, you know, words, and this is a theme that we've heard is that words matter. We're actually doing a study right now. I have a student who is leading a, a, a research study on how words matter when it comes to pelvic pain and how doctors don't know how much they are assholes. Like we don't, right? Like they, they think they're saying the right thing. They, they genuinely, for the most part, come from a place of wanting to help people and wanting to do good. And they don't always know how their words are taken. I can remember an awful thing a nurse said to me when I was going through the IVF process and I was bleeding and she said, and I said, well, it's probably means that like it didn't take it. She said, well, it's certainly not reassuring. And she didn't think anything of it. And yet her words are burned into my brain of, of trauma, right? That's trauma fee. But to her, it was not. And, and I never said anything about how that was hurtful to me. So I didn't educate her. And so there has to be a world. And I tell patients all the time, I had a woman from New Jersey who came in and was gaslit for years and years and years as an anxious patient who just couldn't tolerate a pelvic exam. And the woman had neuroproliferative vestibulodynia and, and a, a tight hymenal ring. And there was no chance she was ever going to have a pelvic exam. There was no space for the speculum to go. You frozen for others? Yeah, yeah. I think I had a <laughs> in an emphatic <laughs> moment. Wait a second. Um, if anybody else wants to potentially jump in, and then maybe we can revisit Dr. Rubin's um, comments afterwards when she's unfrozen. Can actually, I think again, it's it's all it's brilliant to be able to tell doctors and say you haven't done something right but I know when I went to go back to see that particular gynecologist I asked my friend to go with me and on the ruse that actually I didn't necessarily need an interpreter but I said I do want an interpreter but the amount of anxiety that was in me was huge and actually to sit there and say um can I just say it really affected me the last time she didn't she was awful you know, and actually that, you know, and, and it, she was so dismissive of me and made me feel like I was just being, and I hate using this word, but thick. She made me feel like I was just really thick and really stupid. Well, what, and, and what's all, all the fuss about? And actually did me more harm than good. And at that point, I just thought, 
do you know what I've got a choice here I go through trying to educate you and other people or for once actually I really need to to protect myself because I uh, you know I like Rachel Rachel I've been through four rounds of IVF one round of egg donation I've been you end up kind of as a woman I end up saying you know people they give you medical you know medical examinations and I hear myself say this and they say you okay oh I've got no dignity left I say that oh my dignity is way gone by now as a joke ha ha but actually you think about it that's that's one of the main things that we've got you know when we're dying and have palliative care that's the main thing that people are trying to protect isn't it our dignity and I'm just going oh no it's long gone because I've had kids and a bit of IVF with my legs up in a stirrup you know so actually it is important that we tell practitioners but also we've got to make sure that we have that support around us because it can be exceptionally anxiety inducing and it can do more harm than good sometimes so that goes back to the support that we have and making sure that we can have a voice and somebody with us if we can. Totally yeah um I see that Dr. Rubin is back <laughs> um, got kicked off for a little bit uh, if you want to continue your thoughts there, that would be awesome. Oh my God, I was giving my own self this uh, this powerful thing. Everyone froze for a second. I have no idea where you lost me, but I'm sure uh, you could get the gist of what I was saying. I was going to say, I feel like every doctor should really presume that their patients have experienced medical harm. So that's like the starting point, right? And so you kind of have to come in and especially when you're dealing with any patient from an underrepresented or underserved population, you've got to be extra sensitive and maybe take an extra pause, a deep breath, a moment to try and connect with your patient and do your homework. Like, you know, we work in a lot of different, with a lot of different groups of people, which means that since we can't understand all those groups ourselves, we have to do some of that homework in advance. So, you know, if I care about you know, working with people well in my world, why would a why would a provider not care about putting some of the same investment into understanding and learning about some of the different people who might be coming to their doors? So I would I would hope that every provider is starting by understanding that that's very likely with underrepresented but, and underserved populations. They're starting our starting. And it's also on the patients to come back, right? In those 10 minute visit, they're not gonna know everything. And so you have to yeah. advocate for yourself and say, okay, wait a minute, 10 minutes once a year for my pap smear and all my sexual health and all of my cancer screenings and all of those things like that doesn't really make sense. Why don't I go back, you know, every three months to check in with someone who, you know, and see, you know, if you have an issue and something that I do, I'm a big believer in that trauma is in the eye of the beholder, right? That, uh, that, that, that a bad speculation exam can be insanely traumatic. Uh, and there are people who have horrific sexual traumas or uh, physical traumas or all of these things that don't affect their sexual health or their quality of life that don't, you know, so it's that space of also saying, okay, this is you for you to tell me, you know, and, and if, as we develop a relationship to keep that door open of you don't have to tell everything to me on our first visit, but keeping that door open, if there are things that you want to share with me, like I'm here for you. So I, I incorporate into my visit. And again, I'm a rare bird. I can't, I don't do insurance because I cannot take 10 minutes with people. So I spend over an hour with people hearing their stories. And then at the end of the storytelling, I ask them, is there anything else cultural, religious, or trauma related that you want me to know about today as part of your story? And I very intentionally say that, and I've developed it over time as a way to say, I am not going to be the doctor who says, oh, you had a trauma. That's why it's all in your head, lady, uh, you know, or it's all in your head. Sorry, we, we don't have to like look into the biological piece of this, but I can't discount people's psychosocial experiences and their traumas. And so uh, you are a whole person. Your trauma is biology. And so so that is kind of how I approach Rachel, I would travel wherever you are for you to be my doctor. I'm telling you now, it'd be worth it'd be worth getting on a plane <laughs> just to have somebody having those conversations with you. It's huge. That would make a huge difference. Amazing. I really like the framing that um, that Scout had. I went to look at his um, his resources on the Cancer Network, and it said like creating culturally humble medical professionals, and that's something that Rachel Rubin spoke to as well. Is just that recognition that, yeah, people have very likely faced, had harm happen to them. You don't know all the salient points about a person. And I know it's so hard with the 10 minute model that many of us are stuck in if we're not lucky enough to have Rachel Rubin, but there's still 
like room, I think, for a question of like, what is your biggest concern here? What do I need to know? Like Dr. Rubin was saying, um, even in that 10 minutes. And there, there has to be a way for doctors to not be resistant to the fact that they don't know and, and think that that makes them a bad doctor. Like it's what makes you a good doctor and helps you keep learning. And it's not a threat to your authority. Um, the real threat is kind of hardening around the little that you know and continuing that for years and not evolving. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a way to get, um, like, I'm thinking of like a campaign that kind of frames like good doctors don't know, they ask, I don't know. Amazing. Yes. Thank you so much for all your guys' insightful answers on, those, on that question. Um, so that brings us to the end of this event. Um, first off, I'd of course like to rethink all of our amazing panelists today. I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us in terms of our audience here. Um, as I said, there were a ton of other questions that ended up coming in. We do have an opportunity though to kind of keep the conversation going during our networking event later today. It starts at 2.30 p.m. So feel free to come in and join in on that. Um, it'll be super fun, just a nice little mixer for everyone to get to know each other. Um, but yeah, um, was there anything else that needed to be mentioned, Tori? Yeah, just want to give the biggest shout out to our team for putting together this panel and everyone that uh, attended today and shared their thoughts. Um, I know I'm walking away learning so much more than when I entered and feeling really inspired and motivated. I feel like we had the perfect combination of this optimism for what this, you know, feminist health future could look like, while also acknowledging a lot of the harsh realities that we still have to overcome. Uh, of, I just feel so lucky to not be alone in this fight, to have such amazing people fighting alongside all of us. Um, so we are taking about a 10 minute break now, and then we're going to meet back here. Same Zoom link. We'll leave it open for our very own workshop that's on overcoming gender bias in medicine by our workshop team. This is rooted in lived experience about what we've learned um, and gives a lot of practical tips and tricks. It's great for everyone, whether you're in the medical field, the research field, um, a student, or just interested in learning some tips to share with yourself or your community. So definitely stay tuned for that. And like Salma mentioned, the end of the day wraps up with our networking session. So please attend if you can. Um, but if for any reason you can't, definitely reach out on social media. Let's keep the conversation going there. And again, just the biggest thank you to everybody.